I'm gonna be telling five stories. And in those five stories, you're gonna have five outcomes that I think are gonna have play for every single um, business. I always start all of my presentations by talking about my why. Why do we do what we do? I started Trainers.com in 2004 um, with the vision to empower growth and shape the future of learning through innovative training solutions. Primarily because I believe that learning is the only way to take someone from where they've been to where they may want to go. And that's definitely been my story, which you're going to get a chance to see. It's also, um, that's my, my family up there. And um, an, another big reason of my why, my little koala is uh, eight months old now. <laughs> Very excited about that. But we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. I think the biggest thing that I would say to someone who was in my situation growing up, and who's a kid who might find themselves there now, and it's really difficult, you're not defined by your circumstances today. When I think about my story, uh, I recognize that I probably shouldn't be here today. I should probably be one of those statistics that you hear about um, that finds themselves in a generational poverty that is feeding into the criminal justice system. Because those are the scenarios that I grew up in. You know, my parents got divorced at an early age when I was um, three years old. Uh, my mom was trying to get her MBA and it was very difficult. It's a single mom with three kids and this friend uh, at that time introduced her to crack cocaine. And that turned into a 30 plus year struggle with substance abuse. The things of the drug world just became unfortunately a norm. Mom began to pawn things in the house in order to, to be able to buy more uh, drugs. We uh, would go and maybe live with grandma for a little bit. And, but I mean, four kids in a living with grandma just didn't work out. And so we ended up in the projects in, in a little town in Piedmont, Alabama. The funny thing about it is that no one taught me more about love and no one taught me more about um, sacrifice to my mom. It, it could be that she would take your last dollar, but she was always the first one to give, to give her last. In my household, it was expected for you to do your best. You know, it was expected um, for you to take school seriously. And so mom set those expectations at home. Um, I had the opportunity to go to the Alabama School of Math and Science and live on campus, take college level classes my junior and senior year. And that happened because my mom really cared about education. After college, I had the opportunity to move out to Texas and be the internet systems architect for a consulting company. And it was while I was there, my brothers, my two younger brothers were at home and they were really struggling. Uh, my mom's substance abuse problems had gotten worse and they were caught up in that scene. And so they were taken away from my mom. I got custody of my brothers and brought them to, to Dallas, uh, to McKinney, Texas, and those struggles came with them. So we had to work our way through that, and we had to grow through, through that. My youngest brother was reading on a second grade level. He was in the fourth grade, and it took us two years of working with the teachers and with the school hand in hand to get him reading on a sixth grade level by the time he was in the sixth grade. Uh, I was able to start a company in, in 2003 to, that focused on career education and, and training and development, which is near and dear to my heart. It's one of the reasons why I was able to make it out of the situation that I grew up in. And so I get to return that. Um, and at that time, my mom also came from Alabama to live with us and spent nine months in really like total rehab inside the home. It was so awesome because from that moment, she was off of hard drugs and she never went back to hard drugs again. I think the biggest thing that I would say to someone who was in my situation growing up, who's a kid who might find themselves there now, and it's really difficult, you're not defined by your circumstances today. Don't worry about the things you can't do or the things you can't afford or the things that you don't have. Um, don't take shortcuts. The obstacles that we face today really are the things that are catalysts for our future. And to not look at it in a negative light, but to realize that there's growth there and there's opportunity even in the midst of struggle. So, one of the things that I spent the first 15 years of my career at Trainers.com running away from my story. 
We've had more than 60,000 companies purchase training from us. 92% um, of the Fortune 500 have bought training at trainup.com. And I was always afraid to tell my story. And my challenge to you is don't forget everyone who works for you has a story. Let's tap into that story, and that's how we're going to get peak performance, because that's how we're going to get the connection aspect that's really, really critical that technology sometimes can't do. Um, so we're going to jump in. Um, actually, before I talk about this, there's five stories. That actually wasn't a story. That was a bonus story. That's like story six. <laughs> so now we're going to get into the five stories. I'm actually going to tell them. Um, and so the first story I want to talk about is really about community. And, um, and so we will, um, oh, actually, I know what this is for. These are the five points I'm going to tell you. Sometimes I like to paint the big picture at the beginning so you know what you're getting into. This is what you're getting into. Um, you'll have the ability to, uh, we're going to talk about community, ownership and responsibility, uh, mentoring and motivation, uh, continuous feedback, and continuous learning. And the first of those is community. And I put this, if, if we're going to achieve peak performance, um, we're going to have to build a culture of safety and accountability. And so I've got kind of these four C's that I think it takes to build community within an organization. And obviously, technology can be a big part of that, or it can be a detriment. We're going to talk about that. Before we do, so obviously, you saw from that video, I grew up um, very poor uh, in public housing, um, which I know in Australia you're familiar with. I did a little research on your terminology and some of the Aboriginal people and some of the things that are happening here and some of the cultural you know, biases that have, that have happened. And, and, and it's a lot, actually. And um, Australia's come a, a long way, and there's a lot of growth there still um, as we want to um, really not allow that bias to creep its way in. We're going to talk about that some, too. But in my public um, housing, we call them the projects, there was someone there that was very, very critical. Statistically speaking, she's not a success. Um, she's fourth generation um, welfare, and her mom was in the project, she's in the projects, her daughter's in the projects, and her granddaughter's in the project still. None of them made it out. And yet somehow, she's one of my heroes. Because see, in our community, where the outside looking in thought it was very violent, and thought it was unsafe, and it wasn't a place that people would want to be, we found safety there. We found accountability because of Ms. Joyce. At her, at her place, in front of her project, there was um, an area where we could go and we would play kickball. At her house on the weekend, we could go and we'd learn how to play board games like Monopoly and, and things like that. And at her place, you couldn't drink and you couldn't smoke. She brought accountability. If you wanted to be in this community where it was in this place where it was safe, there was responsibility that was there. And because of her, it helped keep us away from the things that often people in my situation find themselves trapped in. So she's one of, my, um, one of my heroes. So how are we going to build culture in our, uh, in our organizations? Because I think culture um, and building a culture that's safe and accountable is very, very important. Sometimes with people analytics, it's employees want to know what we're going to do with the data. And sometimes it doesn't feel so safe. So we get that, you immediately have that little bit of pushback. So we want to figure out how we can build those, those safe places. And true community is the solution for all of these. There's no one solution for each of them. They really work together. And uh, collaboration. Collaboration is key. We can't have community if we don't have collaboration. Um, and we have to have contribution as well. Um, you know you have those teams where it seems like some people are contributing more than, than others. Contribution is critical um, to community, and not just so that everybody's doing their fair part. Why is contribution so important? It's because it's, it triggers within us those emotions that say we matter. And uh, the piece that's really critical is connection. We got to build that connection, that, that glue that keeps it together, and that's how we're going to get through community. Uh, one of the times I went back to visit Ms. Joyce, she said something that was very interesting. Um, I came into her project, and I had started my business. I had been traveling around the world a good bit, and she says, Jeremy, I've been to so many countries this last year. And I'm thinking, well, you're, you're overweight, you're in the project. I'm sure you haven't been on an airplane. How have you been to multiple countries? She says, look over here. I looked on a wall, and she had printed out pictures from my Facebook of places that I had been. She says, I've traveled through you. Now, she could see pictures from anyone, but because of the connection, it matter. So we'll move on to story number two. Um, this is about ownership and responsibility. Ownership and responsibility. So in my um, project where I live, it happened to be that right across the street there was a park. 
And this park is where you it had a basketball court, it had all the, the play things, is where you go. It was kind of the, it was kind of a little epicenter of the community. And this park often, um, you know, was a little messy. And I asked, we asked ourselves, who actually owned the park? Who owns the park that was across the street from our project? The city. The city owned the park. There's no question about it. There's no doubt. The city owned the park. Who was responsible for the park? See how tense that is? Technically, the city owns it. Technically, it's the city's responsibility, right? So my mom uh, wrote this note for me in my memory book before she, she passed. I, I got it. And uh, she says, Jeremy, this reminds you of where you've come from that you once lived in these, these projects and to remember not to look down on, on anyone. And this is how much money we paid for our rent each month, 45 US dollars. Because we were very poor, um, it was sub subsidized. They paid our water and our gas and the entire three bedroom project from our brothers, sisters and I for $45. So if the, park, if the housing authority director sends out a memo to everyone in the project saying, hey, it's your responsibility to clean up the park, how do you think that would have went over? for people paying $45 a month. Not well. <laughs> so one Saturday, out of the blue, we get up and mom says, hey, we're gonna go outside and clean the park. I got three brothers and, and, um, and a sister, and so we, that's enough people to go out there and do some damage, right? So we went across the street and we cleaned the park. First Saturday, we thought, oh, that's cool. The next Saturday, we got up and mom's like, hey, we're gonna go clean the park. And we were like, wait, that, that, we already cleaned the park last week, like, that, we, we good, we got the quota, you know? <laughs> I mean, like, she's like, no, we're, we're gonna clean up again. And by the third week, people in the community started noticing, and they would come out, and they would throw things on the ground, and they would say, pick it up, slave. Pick it up. And we, as instructed by our mom, would pick it up, and we would keep our park clean. But about seven weeks in, something happened. People from the community took notice, and they began to come out and help. And our park was never dirty again. Now, did we own the park? No. We took responsibility. Most of your employees do not own stock in your companies. But you want peak performance, right? If you want peak performance, you have to build a sense of ownership and responsibility. That's very critical to getting the peak performance that we desire. And um, also, um, we've got to try to weed out bias. What happens is that but sometimes just because of who we are, just because of the state that we're in, bias creeps in, it's creeped into our algorithms. We talk about it a lot. But I don't even think it's so much about algorithms. I really think it's about us. I really think it's about expectations. I really think it's about this is the, this is the norm. So I challenge you to begin thinking about what are the norms in your organizations where bias is just present and expectations are just lowered. There are certain people in your organization that you have certain expectations of. If you had to come up with a, a great marketing strategy or you were facing some big challenge in your organization, you're likely going to go to someone that you already believe can meet that challenge. So when I was in the eighth grade, this is my report card. I did pretty good. I had A's and I had a B. I, got a, I was a slacker in math. For some reason, it was really weird I had a, uh, that year. And, but I was in the gift and the talent program in the, in the eighth grade in school. And the high school was less than a mile from where um, the middle school was. So the first day of school is approaching and a week or so before I get my schedule. And on my schedule, I noticed that uh, at our school we have a standard track, we have an advanced track, uh, we have an AP track. And then there's kind of gifts and the talented. Which track do you think I was on? Now, this is what the data says. The data from eighth grade says this, and I'm in the gift and the talent program in the eighth grade. I'm going into ninth grade as a high school student. And the, and the counselors get this data, and they make the determination. What did they choose for me? Of course. Why? Because most of the people in the projects who are African-American in this small town are on the standard track. That's just the expectation. And it's not that they were mean. Literally, it's just it's so baked into us. 
Now, fortunately, my mom um, cared about education, and I was one of those little kids who cared about education, so we got that corrected very quickly. Um, <laughs> and we told them, no, no, no. And then I had to explain to them that I was smart enough, and I had to advocate for myself just to get on in, in, in advance on AP track. Clearly, the data said one thing. Sometimes the data is right. Later, we're going to learn. Sometimes it's not. <laughs> but we've got to work on this because it's an issue. And sometimes it's an issue not in the things that are, um, that are so common. All right. So mentoring and motivation. This is a tough one for me because uh, as a kid, I grew up without my dad. Uh, my parents were divorced at an early age. Um, and for nine and a half years, we were in Buffalo, New York. And um, I didn't see my dad. Um, later in life, he, he actually became a Christian, wanted to get his family back together. He actually remarried my mom. So crazy story. That's how we got back to Alabama. Um, but I think for, for me, um, I struggle with that. And when I think about mentoring, when I think about motivation, um, this is a story for me that rooted in um, growing up without a bat. And so one of the things that I did to cope with that is I actually wrote um, poetry. So I'm going to share a spoken word piece that I wrote when I was 21. It's called Father. I call you Father, but do I really comprehend the meaning of that word spoken when my prayers begin? I call you Father, but what does it really mean? An empty word, a broken home, a shattered dream, the dad I never really had? Why does this word I so often speak stir little emotion within me? So I asked myself, what does father really mean? Broken dreams, broken home, broken everything left alone, standing strong, lacking vision, growing quickly, making decisions, a silly card for Christmas, not even a call. I'm your little boy. Do you care at all? We didn't throw a ball. We didn't shoot a hoop. We didn't catch a pass or even miss a bloop. You never saw a game. You never called my name. You never told me that I didn't have to always win. Father, what does this word really mean? God, when my dad left off, you picked up. You filled that void and overran my cup. You gave me godly uncles and placed other godly men directly in my path to be my friend. Impart some wisdom and show me the way. In the end, you even brought my dad around again. And now I see him as my friend. So I say, Father. I say, Daddy. I say, I love you. So I come to you like the child I am, asking you to lead me, Father. Please hold my hand. As I walk across the street of life, I praise you, God, for your sacrifice. So when I say Father, what do I mean? Everything more than I can dream. And I would guess that none of you in this room got here on your own, did you? Somebody throw out a name of a mentor or someone in your life who's been instrumental in your, in your success in your career. Larry. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. We could all, we could all say that. This aspect of, of mentorship and motivation is critical. And it's got to be ongoing, it's got to be continuous. It can't be at one pick, uh, point in time. And we have technology now in such a way that we can connect people together in ways that mentoring happens naturally. If, we don't, if our technology doesn't move us to the place where things begin to happen naturally without our intervention, then they're not going to happen because they're another thing to do. What we want to be able to do is match people together. We're so worried about developing people's weaknesses that we forget that people are care and they're connected more to their strengths. So how are we leveraging people's strengths and what they care about to connect them to others? You know, when you, you learn the most when you teach. That's where we grow the most. When I was at ASMS, I made A's in physics. I learned physics when I tutored people. That's when I really got it. I studied to make A's and then I understood it when I taught it. We've got to create the opportunities naturally within our, within our organizations. So back to, back to um, my, um, my, my time in, in high school, I had a, a mentor and, and a little bit of motivation uh, going on here as well. Uh, so the data said during my first six weeks of school, uh, the first couple of six weeks here, I, had, I didn't do so great in math. I had a, a 85, 94, a 90. And it was in that first 12 weeks that they determined who was going to be on the math team. And I wanted to be on the math team and go to the math competitions. Because, I mean, it was a part of skate, but I thought I was smart. I wanted to compete. I wanted to win. 
But they make the determination of who's on the team on the first 12 weeks, and the data said, I didn't make the cut. So I went to the, um, my math teacher and said, no, I can do it. I'm, I'm, I'm smart. I can do it. I want to be on the math team. I have this passion for it. It's a desire. Where in your companies are people crying out for opportunities to advance and grow and challenge themselves? You should pay attention. So this teacher didn't really pay attention. said, Jeremy, this is the rules. So then I went to the math team coach, OK? It was another math teacher. She wasn't my math teacher. And I said, hey, will you mentor me? Because I, you know, I'm struggling. I really want to be on that team. I thought I'd butter up a little bit. Maybe she would get, let me get on the team, you know? Um, and secretly, because I like to win, I was motivated to prove that teacher wrong. And as you can probably see, the second half of that year, I said, OK, screw you. I'm going to make a perfect score on every test the rest of the year. And that's what happened. And this math teacher who was mentoring me created another spot on the team. <laughs> and I scored the highest in the state. Just saying. So um, <laughs> when people are passionate about things, that's what we need to feed. If you want to change your, your, your company, you, let your tech figure out where, what people care about. That's what they're connected to. Likely, they're going to be motivated to do pretty well. So continuous feedback. This is, um, this is an interesting one. Uh, I'm going to skip over the story here because we are running a little bit low on time. But there's, when you think about peak performance, when you think about really great things um, that happen or where people go above and beyond, I don't think we have to go too far but to understand what happens in sports. Um, in sports, we're taking an individual and most likely a team, and we're moving them or we're challenging them to go above and beyond what's physical, what's mental, to accomplish something that's great. These kind of autobiotic experiences, otherworldly type of performances. I mean, we want our people to be able to perform like that all the time. Professional athletes have to figure out the rhythm to do that. So what's one of the key attributes of high performance? When we analyze this, we found something really interesting. There's actually continuous feedback and a lot of encouragement. <laughs> You ever wonder why, like, why athletes, they, they do one good thing and they're all high five and they're celebrating, you know? And it's like, yeah, you know? It's, it's constant, it's consistent. If you watch a basketball game, you know, so anybody, everybody knows Steph Curry, right? Go to say words. I mean, I know basketball's popular here. Andrew Bogut, Ben Simmons, come on. I mean, y'all got some. You know, even, well, maybe not Ben Simmons. Every time, Curry, Curry makes a lot of threes, okay? Every time Steph Curry makes a three, he like holds up his little three. He does what he does. He's high-fiving his teams. I'm like, dude, you, you, were, you shoot basketball all day, every day. Like, is it that exciting to make a three? <laughs> but this is constant and consistent encouragement. Now, think about this. If he shot and he made a three, and he went down the court, his teammates were like, you're supposed to do that. Ugh, I expected it. <laughs> That's what you're paid to do. What do you think that does emotionally? Psychologically. I mean, this is serious because this is how we treat our people. You're supposed to. You're paid to. So later today, you're, when I talk about knowledge flow, you're going to get the, the tech side of this. But the research that went into that, um, we began to think about what do employees actually want? What do they crave? And what we found outside of raises, the number one thing that employees wanted was consistent and continuous feedback. Employees want you to pat them on the back for the great work they're doing today, not the great work they did last year. It's in the moment. Curry, when he gets the MVP award, he knows it was a collective body of work. But it was in that moment on the court, every one of those threes where his teammates were motivating him and high-fiving him. And when he missed one, they have the same reaction. What happens when we miss in business? Do we encourage? Do we come alongside? Because if we want peak performance, we should. Because if you don't, you get that effect. And we want this effect. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, so last, um, last thing, I'll, I threw this in, and I'll talk about it more later. But we actually, in our research, determined that today's standard ways of giving feedback um, weren't enough, and they didn't work. Uh, anybody ever been on YouTube, and they have like a thumbs up and a thumbs down? Like when you see a video and you, they got a bunch of thumbs down, like what, what does that mean? So we decided in our feedback methodology, we're going to give acknowledgments and encouragements. 
And anytime you give an encouragement, you can't give a thumb down. You have to actually write encouragement. You can't leave um, an encouragement without actually giving the text. That's encouraging. And so people need to grow and get that feedback continuously, you know? So when, when Curry's playing sloppy with the ball, Coach Kerr pulls him aside and he whispers in his ear. And he gives him a little encouragement. <laughs> um, and the last piece of this, and, and what we're really um, super excited about, is the aspect of knowledge sharing and continuous learning. Um, so inevitably, we all know that continuous learning is important. Does anybody here think that continuous learning is, is like not important? <laughs> that you should stop learning? That you got to figure it out? Anybody in here think they have it figured out? This is a room of high performers. And you don't think that you have it figured out. Hmm. So what we found in our companies, however, is that we are creating learning silos. So information alone is not enough to produce change. But what do we do in corporate America? We give people access to information. And we expect that information alone to be transformative. That's not actually how we learn. You see, we learn best together. If you've ever taken an e-learning course, who's taken an e-learning course for your company and your company this year? Now, L&D knows that you started that course, you finished it, and what your score was. Do any of you know how that course impacted anyone else in your company? See, that's a learning silo. Now, do the top performers learn that way? Let's see. So um, in 1995, oh, I keep pushing the, my world changed. I was this poor kid in, this, in the worst school district in Alabama who had a lot of potential. But I didn't have the right environment. I didn't have the right opportunities. And um, my mom found out about this school called the Alabama School of Math and Science, where you live on campus, take college level classes. And they accept the top 140 students out of the state. You take the SATs early. And from our school, even though it was a terrible school, two people got accepted, which is a rarity, and both were named Jeremy. Now, this Jeremy was really smart, Jeremy Nawyer. Like, I don't know what you know about standardized test scores, but his score in the seventh grade ranked in like the 94th percentile in the nation. Just saying. So at this school, really smart kids. We had like the number two physics kid in the nation. We had Ryan Williams, who's a professor at MIT now. He wrote a compression algorithm during our junior year that beat PK zip by 9% as a high schooler. Of course, when zip came out the next year, crap. Um, but my life changed because of this opportunity. At my school at Piedmont, the highest math I could take was pre-cal. At ASMS, I finished with BC calculus. It was accelerated, you had to learn fast. But I had potential, I didn't have opportunity. Where's the potential in your organization? And how do you match that with the right opportunities? Technology can help us with that. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about Quickly, though, one, one of the things that happened here, uh, we're going to skip over this, but we want to move people from a traditional to a modern, silo to network, complacent to curious, conventional to innovative, rigid to agile. This is the kind of modern organization we want to create from a learning perspective. We don't create these. We create courses. We create content. We create classes. But we're not giving people the learning experience that they need to actually reach that, because continuous learning is not about just that moment. There's a collective. So something interesting happened at uh, the Alabama School of Math and Science. The top 140 students in the state were required to do something every night for two hours. What was that? Study hall. We had mandatory study hall for the smartest kids in the state. Two hours, all of us in a room with cafeteria-like tables studying for two hours every night. Do you think we dreaded it or you think we loved it? We ate it up, <laughs> ate it up. Everybody came literally every day, and we just helped each other. We tutored. You need this. You need that. You got to remember, we're doing a semester in nine weeks, OK? So we need to study, too. And, and that environment, was, it, was, it was contagious. There was no um, bad study habits. You literally were forced to. It was mandatory. And it created a routine and a rhythm in us. And we all did it together. So the collective noise, the collective study, the collective help was how we learned and we performed at an exceptionally high level. And that's what we want to do in our organizations as well. So not going to get into um, all of that. We're, we're going to finish this up. Uh, you'll, my next um, talk about knowledge flow, you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about tech. I would love your feedback. 
uh, in an effort to give continuous feedback. Uh, you can go to this URL and give me feedback on the talk today. But thank you so much for your time. It's been amazing. Hopefully you got some good takeaways um, from, from our time today. But thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here in Australia. Uh, I love Sydney, and it's just an amazing place. So thank you.